In this episode, I had the pleasure to talk with Mr. Dan Rachel, acting director of NRDC's Pollinator Initiative and one of the lawyers behind Birds and Bees Protection Act, an important bill banning almost completely the use of neonicotinoids in the state of New York. We discussed the meaning of this important bill, what is included and what is not, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Welcome to Inside the Hive.tv podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Umberto Bon Cristian. In this podcast, we talk about the teachings of the most successful society in natural history, the honeybees. It doesn't matter if you're a beginner and an advanced beekeeper or just curious about honeybees. Here, you'll find great conversations to educate and entertain yourself about this wonderful insect. From honeybee biology to how to make money with honeybees, you won't miss anything here. Inside the Hive.tv podcast is brought to you by our fans on Patreon. On Patreon, you can access all episodes before anybody else and exclusive content, like behind the scenes videos, live streams and more. If you want to learn more about honeybees and help me to make more content about honeybees to everybody, please visit patreon.com slash inside the hive TV and join our community. All right. Well, then, welcome to the show. I was completely surprised yesterday. I got an email from a, from a friend telling me, Umberto, they just passed a bill banning a gigantic amount of neonicotinoids in New York. And I said, I started to laugh. I thought it was a joke. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's not a joke. It's real life. Uh, and, and first off, Umberto, thanks for, for having me on, on the program today. Um, yeah, the bill is the Birds and Bees Protection Act. It was just passed by the New York legislature. This is a nationally important bill. It's a nationally leading bill. And essentially what it does is it's a, it's a targeted ban on a class of very insect toxic pesticides known as neonicotinoids or, or neonics for short. Um, these are likely the most ecologically harmful pesticides we've seen since DDT. They're a huge, huge concern for bees. And actually, when neonics um, started to be used across the country uh, on a widespread basis, that's sort of when you see colony collapse disorder and the, you know, the rising levels of hive losses that we saw across the country. But actually, in the last 20 years, we've also learned that these pesticides are just you know, very destructive across entire ecosystems hollowing out uh, aquatic ecosystems, driving mass losses of birds, polluting water and soil and plant life on a vast scale, getting into the bodies of deer and people you know, with concern for neurotoxic effects for, for people, especially children as well, uh, or, or prenatally exposed children. So, so this is a huge, huge issue. Again, the, these are the most widely used insecticides in the United States, probably some of the most harmful. And the bill in New York would get rid of about 80 to 90 percent of the outdoor uses of the uses of those pesticides that are getting into the environment every year. And the good news is it does that by only prohibiting those uses that extensive research from Cornell University have shown either provide no benefits to users, so they're, they're not actually providing any value, or they're easily replaced um, with safer alternatives. That's fantastic news. Uh, I, I cover many, many of these uh, scientific research uh, publications in my channel, and I, I thought I was alone, and that's, that's great to ne news to me. And I'm going to keep covering and I want to know how I can help you guys in the near future. But can we start like what, what is the bill does or say exactly? So what, what, I work with a lot of farmers and I, I know we're going to hear a lot from them trying to explain what, it, what, what is that? What's going on? Yeah. And I, I think um, and one thing to clarify, too, before we drill into the bill, which is which is great. Um, you know, the legislature passed the bill. The bill has not yet been signed by the governor. Yes. So so that may take several months before the bill gets to Governor Hochul's desk. We're obviously hopeful that she will sign the bill, but it's not, it's by no means a done deal, but, but still very exciting. But the bill itself is just a, a phenomenally common sense bill and is a pro-farmer bill across the board. 
in terms of the way that it is surgically targeted to particular neonic uses. So the only agricultural uses affected in the bill are neonic coatings on corn, soy, and wheat seeds. And these are known as seed treatments. And that accounts for about three quarters of all the neonic use in New York agriculture. So huge, huge use. It covers well over a million acres in New York and also probably the most widespread use in New York. It's not regulated by DEC. DEC, the state environmental regulator, which normally regulates most pesticides, doesn't regulate seeds coated with pesticides. So it's a big regulatory loophole. That's sort of one of the needs for the bill. This is an area where the state is not actively regulating. And um, there was a huge, huge report from Cornell University that looked at over 1,100 peer-reviewed papers. And what that report found was that these seed coatings on these three crops provide no overall net income benefit to farmers. So to break that down a little bit more, very rarely do you see a yield benefit with those uses. But even when you do, the additional cost of having the pesticide on the seed versus that small benefit is sort of a wash economically. So, so again, largest use of neonics in New York, also the least justifiable, right? Because they're not providing those net economic benefits. The other thing that the Cornell report found was that non-agricultural uses outdoors, so lawns, gardens, golf courses, these are uses that pose some of the highest risks to bees because they're used at very high concentrations. They're used on pollinator attractive plants, right? Bees are visiting these plants. And if you know anything about neonics, the way that they work is they are designed to permeate plants, to get into their leaves, their pollen, their root, their nectar, everything. And that's why they can be applied on seeds, right? As that plant is growing from the seed, it literally soaks up the pesticide through its roots and becomes toxic. Every part of that plant becomes toxic and becomes pesticidal, including the pollen and the nectar. And that's why they're used in these lawn and garden spaces. You know, if you have your pollinator garden and you're treating it with neonics, those uh, pesticides are getting into the pollen and nectar. And these are probably the most insect toxic pesticides ever created. Uh, to give you a sense of scale here, neonics have made US agriculture about 50 times more harmful to insect life since their introduction, with just one neonic treated corn seed having enough active ingredient to kill a quarter million bees, and one square foot of treated lawn having enough active ingredient to kill a million bees. So very, very potent insecticide. So the other use that the bill targets for prohibition is the lawn and garden uses. There are a lot of exceptions and safety valves in the bill. So on the seed ban side, that ban can be relaxed if the environmental regulator DEC in consultation with Ag and Markets, the, uh, the state agricultural agency, finds that there are no commercially available seeds without the neonic treatments, or if purchasing the non neonic treated seed would cause undue financial hardship. So there's a safety valve there. If the seed's not available, if it would cause financial hardship, the state can relax the ban. On the non ag side, there's a straight exception for invasive species and woody plants. So it can, neonics can still be used against hemlock woolly adelgid, spotted and lanternfly, emerald ash borer. All of these invasive species that we know are really harmful to trees and other woody plants, neonics can, can still be used there because one of the things in the Cornell report that I mentioned earlier is they found that the one use that you would really want to preserve in the non-agricultural space is for those invasive species. And we know invasive species are bad too, right? We don't want to use neonics needlessly but there are maybe a few applications where we would want to preserve those uses. And then there's also an exception that DEC, again, the environmental regulator can use for environmental emergencies. So sort of, uh, again, a, another safety valve, if there is a really justifiable use of these pesticides, the bill allows for that. But what we've seen other places that have gotten rid of these pesticides is, you know, folks have largely not missed them. 
and neonics have been largely prohibited in Europe since starting in 2013, but really in 2018, when a complete ban went into place, they're being phased out in Canada. We're not seeing switching to more harmful replacements for these particular uses targeted by the New York bill. The New York bill is a lot more targeted than what happened in Europe, right? It's based on this report that looks just at New York. It's targeted just at those uses that are identified as needless, right? Or mm -hmm. easily replaced with safer alternatives. So I think one thing that we would want to stress about the bill is how surgically targeted it is and how much it's going to help farmers across the board. Because if we get rid of these pesticides that are driving bee losses, and it's not just honeybees, but native bees as well, which we know are declining in New York from a recent report, that's going to help anybody who relies on bees to produce crops. And we know already from other science, apple production is down nationwide. Cherry production is down nationwide. These are two really important crops in New York. And they're down because of a lack of bees and other pollinators. We don't have enough pollinators to produce the top yields for these crops. And that's true worldwide. It's especially true in the United States. And um, so again, this, this bill is going to benefit anybody who's relying on a bee to boost their yields. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that because in my work as a consultant, I, I, some beekeepers even hired me to do tests, specifically tests in their own operation, because they were suspicious about, they're, they're, they're driven by fear, basically. They couldn't see the economic value they, they were suspicious about, but they couldn't change anything because they were scared. It, we, only with the imagination of, okay, if I do a little test here and nothing happened, I'm going to lose my whole operation or things like that. So I, I, I have farmers reaching out with that thought. And now you guys are, that makes a lot of sense to me. Make, makes a lot of sense to me from the things I heard from the field, from the ground. So very, very interesting. Uh, how long did it, it took for this whole thing to happen? How, how, how many times you guys tried? Can you give me a little overview of the timeline and how hard it, it was to, to get it? where we are today? I think there was a huge effort from a lot of people. It included sort of the usual suspects, right? Your environmental groups. Yep. It included some, some grassroots groups, so Pollinator Pathways, which are sort of a new group of, of organizations sprouting up across the state and the country that are focused on, on helping pollinators. It also included health experts. There are a number of doctors that are very worried about these pesticides because they're neurotoxic and the thought is, you know, like lead or mercury, there may be no safe level of these pesticides in people's bodies. And we know actually from CDC monitoring, they're in at least half the American population. On any given day, about half of us have neonics in our bodies. And a more recent study from of New York women and women from four other states found neonics in over 95% of their bodies with levels rising every year from 2017 to 2020. So again, health experts, very, very concerned about these pesticides. They were a, a key component. Um, farmers, you know, there are a lot of farmers that are worried about the impacts of these pesticides, particularly farmers that are dependent on pollinators, particularly farmers that are, you know, trying to do re organic or regenerative agriculture because these pesticides do spread through the environment. They get into water so they can contaminate lands. They can get rid of not only the, the beneficial pollinators, but also the pest predators, right? The good bugs that eat the bad bugs. They get rid of the bugs that are good for soil health, like earthworms and other soil decomposers. So I think there was a lot of support from, you know, small farms in the organic community. Um, I'm trying to think who else. There were a lot of folks, uh, certainly certainly environmental justice groups as well, because we know that the exposure to these pesticides is not equal in terms of who has the body burden with these pesticides and actually seeing much higher levels of neonics in Hispanic populations. So, and, and also people not being able to avoid neonics. You know, one good way to avoid them is to eat all organic produce. Another good way is to you know, put a fancy filter 
on your water supply to get the neonics out of tap water if they happen to be contaminating your water. So that's not an option that is available to everybody. So I think it was it was a huge coalition of groups. It was a diverse coalition. Oh, and businesses, breweries supported this. Um, a number of small businesses, the New York Sustainable Business Council um, supported the bill. Um, yeah, pediatricians. It, there was a whole group of folks that came out in support of the bill. And I think it needed a coalition like that because there was some strong opposition from folks that are, you know, there was some that you know, that are afraid of the change there. Although I do think there was a lot of misinformation about the bill in terms of what it affected and what didn't. People thought, oh, this was an entire neonic ban. It, it really isn't. It's just on these treated seeds and the non-agricultural uses. But it took a big coalition and it took many years. I think the first version of the Birds and Bees Protection Act came out in 2019. Uh, that may be, I may wow. be off. It could have been 2018, but I think the first version came out in 2019. Although it really wasn't until 2020 that the bill became what it was. Because in 2020, we got this huge report from Cornell. And then the bill changed to map the findings of that report. Initially, it was just a five-year moratorium on neonics. But then we got the report, the science came in. And we said, oh, look, we can get 80 to 90 percent of the problem and we can just focus on these particular uses. You know, we don't have to go after other fruit and vegetable uses or, you know, other uses that may like for invasive species that may provide some benefits, but really yeah. focusing on those unnecessary uses. So I think the first version of the bill that responded to that report was 2021. And um, it still took a lot of effort over many years. Wow. And let's imagine the government sign. What's, what's the timeline for us to see these things fade away? So it's going to take a while. Uh, let's say the governor does sign. The ban on non-agricultural uses is the start of 2026 and the ban on the corn, soybean, and wheat seed coatings is 2027. Okay. So it's going it's to take a while to kick into effect. That, again, is another safeguard in the bill to allow markets to adjust to the shift. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, how long does it take for neonics to get out of the environment? Right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's my, my, my concern. When I want to see that thing out of the equation. <laughs> so, and you know, you're, 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 uh, you know, you have a PhD and, and probably understand, you know, some of the science better than I do, but it, you know, it's, it's complicated because we have five different neonic chemicals. They're in a variety of environments, right? They're in woody plants, they're in soil, they're in water. I mean, these things are everywhere, right? Yeah. In, in half of our bodies or, or more. So they're everywhere and they've been building up over years. So the question is, you know, how long does it take? It, it's going to depend where they are. It's going to depend which chemical, um, but sort of an overall guess, you know, we're talking half lives of these pesticides that are in, you know, maybe the three year range, three, four year range. So they're cycling out of the environment, maybe over five to 10 years, something like that. Um, you know, every day is better. Once we stop putting more of these yeah. into the environment, every day gets better. And the good news is these aren't like PFAS or PCBs, right? They are going to break down eventually, but, but it's going to take quite some time, which is why we have to start as, as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to, to, to ask you if you know, if there is other efforts now nationwide i know vermont has some initiative in the past i don't know how it's going right now but i i, I do you know other other states and how you know this is a breakthrough and how do you think this bill is going to be a template for other states to try something and maybe a nationwide kind of approach um you know i think it's too early to tell 
I think it has a lot to do whether the bill gets signed or not, right? If it, yeah, if, yes. if it gets vetoed, maybe not so much. Yep. Um, but, you know, I think it is also, I, on the non-agricultural side, this bill is actually not the first. So New Jersey, Maine, and now Nevada, very recently, just um, a few weeks ago, banned neonics in these non-agricultural settings. Oh. So New York, New York would actually be the fourth state to do that if the bill became enacted. So those so, other states, they are, is a done deal? Is already signed? It is a done deal, and those bills are signed. Uh, Maine and New Jersey passed bills last year. Nevada passed its bill, again, just a few weeks ago. It was signed by Governor Lombardo, who you know, is a very conservative figure. This was a bill that passed in the legislature by bipartisan supermajorities. So very wow. popular, very popular issue over there. Um, and again, in the non-agricultural world, I think you're going to see more and more states take that wow. um, approach because, of course, we've seen other places, Europe uh, and elsewhere. These are not, you know, these are not needed for, for your lawn and your garden. So um, on the seed side, New York would be the first. And that's a big deal because by far the biggest use of these pesticides nationwide is going to be as coatings on those corn and soybean seeds. And it really, it wasn't the introduction of neonics that we see that links up really well with the mass losses of bees and colony collapse. What, ma what maps up with that massive loss that we see in the mid-2000s is where these pesticides start being used on corn and soybean seeds. After that point, their use just exploded nationwide. And most of that use outside of maybe the deep south, you know, as the Cornell report shows and other reports show, that's not providing economic benefits, right, to, to farmers on balance. Yep. So, so that's what's so remarkable about this bill. That's what's so important about it. Although if we look around the world and in just across the border in Quebec and Ontario, they basically don't use neonic treated seeds anymore. And they haven't for several years and yields have been unaffected, right? There's, they're still growing corn. They're still growing soybeans. So it's a nationally important bill here in the United States. But just across the border from New York, they've been doing it without neonics for, for quite some time. And the same is true of Europe. They haven't used neonics on corn and soybean there since 2013. So um, like a lot of things, when it comes to pesticides, the United States generally lags behind, which is why it's so important that states like New York and other leading states show that, hey, it can be done here. You know, the, yeah, yeah. it's going to be okay. That's the way I feel. If a, if a big state like New York, okay, it passed in New York now. What are you going to talk about? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Wow. And one, one lesson I learned, I cannot trust Google to tell me what's going on regarding pesticides. I didn't know about those other states. I, I keep, you know, I have those Google uh, things to tell me what's going on. And I didn't receive anything related to that. I well, didn't know. Maybe you can ask chat GPT. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to change. <laughs> bye bye, Google. <laughs> yeah. I still like Google. I still like I, Google. I do. I do like yeah. Google, but I, I, I can't. How I never heard about that. You know, I am in the field and I'm looking for those things. And that passed through me. Maybe maybe I, did, I need to do a better job. OK, Daniel, I, I want to thank you. I think you cover all my questions in, in one shot. <laughs> I have a list of questions here, but you already passed through all of those. I, I can't think about anything else that I have. So I'm going to leave all the information you guys at home need to, to, to see the bill, to, to take a look at the report of the university report. So you can, we can have all the information in, by yourself and go and read it. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Leave a link in the description of the video. Send an email to me uh, if I don't know the answer. Uh, then you're going to help me here. 
I'm gonna poke him all the time now to what's going on with this. I don't I don't have an answer, so Dan can help us out. And yeah, so with that in mind, Dan, I want to thank you a lot for your time and congratulate you for this five years battle, I guess. And I think this is good news. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's great news. And Humberto, thank you so much for having me on the program and, and happy to be bothered with questions anytime. Okay, we will. We will. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Inside the Hive.tv podcast is brought to you by our fans on Patreon. On Patreon, you can access all episodes before anybody else and exclusive content like behind the scenes videos, live streams, and more. If you want to learn more about honeybees and help me to make more content about honeybees to everybody, please visit patreon.com/insidethehive tv and join our community. Thank you.